what is up everyone welcome you're checked into another episode of whistlekick martial arts radio this one's 794 with my guest today sifu rick cropper <laughs> it's a doozy i'm jeremy lesniak i founded whistlekick because i love traditional martial arts and i am investing everything i have and everything i am into this global pursuit community sport whatever you choose to call it and if you want to see all the things that we have lined up the things that we're doing to help students and instructors and school owners and competitors and promoters and all those folks go to whistlekick.com it's the place we put everything everything at least links off of there and we're adding stuff all the time you want to know all the stuff that we're adding well you should probably join the newsletter list you can do that from whistlekick.com but our mission here is to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world. And we're trying to get every single person to train for six months. I believe that would make the world a dramatically better place. And I bet you see the value in that too. If you want to help us out in our mission to do that, well, we've got lots of things you can do. The first thing you could do, you could go to whistlekick.com. You can go to the store and you can find maybe some sparring gear or maybe a shirt or maybe a hat or maybe an event join the newsletter list there are so many things going on over there that i can't even tell you all of them but actually if you join the family page whistlekick.com family we have them all listed out there as well as some bonus kind of exclusive well, not kind of it is exclusive behind the scenes stuff our show martial arts radio what uh some outlets refer to as the top traditional martial arts podcast actually i had the traditional they just call it the top martial arts podcast in the world we're pretty proud of that and we work hard to keep that title has its own website whistlekickmartialartsradio.com two episodes each and every week because we well we're trying to connect educate and entertain you we love you all we love traditional martial arts the team here is fanatical about delivering the best possible value that we can but if you go to that website what are you going to find over there? You're going to find every episode we've ever done. Coming up on 800 episodes. Show me another way that you're going to find that much awesome martial arts content and not spend a nickel. Oh, wait. Nope. There's nothing. There's nobody out there delivering more valuable free content than Whistlekick because we love what we do. Now, if you love what we do, and hopefully some of you, well, I know some of you, quite a few of you, in fact, contribute to our Patreon because you want to see, you want to show the value, you want to keep this thing going. And you, let's face it, you want the goodies that we throw you if you contribute to the Patreon. Two bucks a month is where you can get in, goes up to $100 a month. We've got tiers in between with all kinds of cool stuff. Go to patreon.com slash whistlekick and check out the stuff that we have available there for you. People rarely stop because we crush it. My guest today, Sifu Rick Cropper. I met Sifu Rick at Free Training Day Pacific Northwest, which we held for the first time in 2022. And I have to say, I don't know that I've met anyone with more energy. This man is intense. And if you think our episode today is intense, training with him is more so. Now, I don't know too many people who you know what I, I'm, I'm gonna give stuff away i don't want to give stuff away i had a blast and i have no doubt that this could have been a six hour episode and he wouldn't have lost steam we're going to have him back as long as he's willing because i had such a blast and the stories are amazing there's history there's a, just great stuff going on in this enjoy thank you for having me on uh your thank, whistle kick podcast you. i've been looking forward to this for a while. I, I have, I have too, since I met you and it, met you and, and said to Andrew, I was like, we got to have this guy on the show. And he's like, <laughs> I was going to say the same thing to you and happy birthday. Oh, uh, you know what? This is absolutely insane. I cannot believe I'm 62 years old. It's insane. I can't, be I can't believe you're 62 years old. It's insane. I still you have like more energy kid, than man. almost anybody I know. <laughs> What's your secret? Oh, uh, praise the Lord. 
It all well, comes from the Lord. Well, it's got to be more than that, because well, there, are, there are plenty of plenty of people who will, you know, offer up and and. Uh, okay, so I'll credit it. I'll credit it to sparring. Okay, I credit it to sparring. You, you oh. okay? Here's the deal. I have a best friend, a, a trusted friend. His name is Doug Bertrand. Now, there's a, a lot of... Uh, elite I've heard that name, by the way. There's a lot of elite point fighters who've come from this part of the country. The first one being recognized is Dan Anderson. Mm -hmm. Okay. Doug Bertrand is from a different planet. This guy is the most amazing point fighter there ever was. Uh, mm -hmm. I've known him for um, 30 or 40 years, I think. I've been sparring with him every Friday... For 27 years he's got a huge uh school everybody calls it uh bertrand's palace it's a double decker school cool. i've been sparring with him every friday morning for 27 years uh doug bertrand former uh nasca world champion mm -hmm. and then another guy i've known for 40 years marty may uh nbl former mm -hmm. nbl world champion and uh, and a new guy to the group, Isaac Atkins, who's six foot five, 22 years old, and is the current World Karate Union champion. He won that in uh, Wales, Europe, like the week before my tournament. Okay. So, so you, every you, you hang out with some heavy hitters. I don't know if you, well, elite point fighters. Yeah, that, that's that's what I mean. I don't mean necessarily contact heavy hitters, but. So we whack each other. Oh, we I whack each other. I but here's the deal with these guys. We love each other. Mm. We trust each other. We push each other. Nobody's got weird attitudes at all. We're there to improve, but we're there to help each other. Yeah. And so it's like, hey, what did you do? I went like this and I went like this. Well, what did you do? Hey, hey man, your defense is really good. So we're, we're there to help each other, mm. but we're there to push each other. And it helps keep me accountable for everything I do during the week because going to Friday spar is like going to a tournament. Okay. okay. So this is what I do four to five days a week in a row. I do a 24 hour fast four to five days in a row, a 24 hour fast. This is why I do it because I want to okay. be light. Everybody has reach on me. And then mm -hmm. the 22-year-old kid. And, and, and for, for folks who aren't this, watching, how tall are you? Because this is uh, relevant. Six, three and a half. <laughs> try, ah! try again. No, I, hey, I, was, I was six feet tall in, uh, in high school. Six, two. Oh, I had platforms. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> and I'm five, six. And I weigh 140. Yeah. At 62 years old, the way I stay light, the way I stay light is I do that 24 hour fast yeah. five days a week so are you eating okay. once in between 24 hour fast eat then 24 hours again this is what i do okay uh so i i have two cheat days okay, okay. after i spar on friday it's cheat day i mean i'm heading right for winco to get cheesecake man and and hamburger and bacon and cheese because i'm gonna eat a cheesecake i mean it's my cheat day yeah Saturday's another cheat day. Okay. Sunday, sometimes it's a 48 hour fast, but I'll only eat, I'll, I'll eat once in the evening. I mm -hmm. won't eat it all um, uh, Monday mm -hmm. during the day. I, I work, uh, I work, I work four tens, Monday through th Thursday. I eat nothing while I'm at work. I okay. train while I'm at work. Okay. And I'll tell you my, Oh, if I'm going to be in some place for 10 to 12 hours and not train, that's not real proper. Yeah. And they let me train. I've what, been there what do you, 30 What do you do? What kind, of, what kind of work do you do? Uh, for 38 years, I've worked for, it's now the Georgia Pacific Paper Company. I'm a okay. forklift driver. I've been there 38 okay. years. Okay. And I'm 62 today, so I'm getting ready to retire. But um, uh, where are we at? <laughs> oh, so I go. Okay, yeah. so at work. I, on my on my eight o'clock break, this is what I do in my eight o'clock break: a hundred push-ups, three hundred sit-ups. Okay, and then I I uh, go into my uh, yoga poses for my stretch because mm -hmm. I got arthritic 
arthritis in my hip and I got no ACL. And I mean, I have to, I have to exercise and I have sure. to stretch just to be able to walk. Sure. So my eight o'clock break is a 15 minute break, hundred pushups, 300 sit-ups, 260 leg lifts. And then I do my yoga. Then I go back out to work and I, I drive a forklift and I load trucks. So whenever there's like a break, I go hide somewhere. And then I, I, I go, I grab the seat, the handle that's on the seat, my forklift. And I throw side kicks. 10. Then I go to the other side, 10. Then I go to round kicks, 10. Round kicks, 10. Then I go to hook kicks, 10. Hook kicks in. Then I go to my my two-part kicks. Side kick, side kick, wheel kick, wheel kick, hook kick, hook kick. Same thing on the other side. Then I go to my three-part kicks, okay? Side kick, side kick, wheel kick, wheel kick, wheel kick, boom. So I do, so I do try to do that once a day or sometimes twice a day. And then on, on my... My lunchtime, I'm either talking to my girlfriend or I'm training at lunchtime too. And I'm not eating nothing. What I'm doing is I'm we have water stations everywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm sipping a little bit of warm water. Mm -hmm. Actually, if it's warm water, I hammer it. Because you can't hammer cold water because it'll it'll freeze your throat. And I'm drinking, I'll pour because we get free coffee at work. Mm -hmm. I'll pour about this much coffee in a cup. And water bit. it, and I'll sip that up, or I'll do tea. So all day long, I'm not eating. I'm staying hydrated, but not overhydrated because I like to cut weight on Monday and Tuesday and be a little bit dehydrated because I ate all those cheeseburgers and all that cheesecake during the weekend. So, and then Wednesday is when I start hydrating. That's that's getting that's getting prepped mm. for the Friday spar. Okay, so all yeah. week long I'm getting ready for the friday spar and then here's how else i get ready for the friday spar. at 60 in my 60s i'm sparring better than i have in my entire life and i've been sparring since i was like eight years old i'm sparring better in my 60s than any time in my now, life when you say better when you say you're sparring better be more specific is it just you're sparring smarter or are you also faster you have better movement as well I'll, I'll explain it to you right okay. now. Okay, please. So I've, I've been I've been sparring forever, okay. And there's for some reason when I'm sparring in the in the Northwest, I sh struggle to win. But if I'm in New York, if I'm in Maui, Maui, Hawaii, where I won that in Maui, Hawaii, Texas, I'm out there just rocking and I win. And I, I'm like, what's how? What's the deal there? There's something going on there. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? I'm in totally great shape. How come I'm always winded? How come I'm always winded? This is, there's something going on here. So uh, one of my students turned me on to a, a Joe Rogan podcast. I, did, I didn't know anything about Joe Rogan had a mm -hmm. podcast, but I, I was um, watching um, George St. Pierre and Joe Rogan and, and George St. Pierre was talking about when he fought Michael Bisbing mm -hmm. and beat him, he actually had a, co a colostic uh, ulcer. He was sick. Mm. I didn't know that. And he got really sick after the fight. And he said, I, he said he found a doctor named Jason Fung, Montreal, Canada, mm -hmm. who's healing him of his ulcer by time restricted eating and fasting i'm like so i started i started watching all these youtubes of this jason fung guy and i started finding out how beneficial fasting was mm -hmm. so that four years ago that's when i started doing my fasting so i got lighter so being lighter made me faster Okay. Yep. It was less pressure on my joints because there's arthritis right here. There's uh, no ACL, no mm. meniscus here. And, and I got stuff going. So I'm lighter. So it's gentler on my body. So then um, I started, how come I'm winded all the time? And I'm, 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 I'm in really great shape. So I, I started Googling breathing for boxers. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a guy, his initials are JT. 
okay? Mm-hmm. And his his uh, podcasts or his YouTubes are called Precision Striking. And I, I learned how to breathe properly from watching this dude's uh, YouTube. What, what, what's he doing differently with the breath? I had found out that I had, I would take a big gulp of breath mm-hmm. and just go out there and throw a million techniques and then jump back. Take a nut. So, I mean, I had been not continuing the flow of breathing. So now I'm, my breathing is excellent. And I play this guy's, it, when I go to work, I, I got a routine. I'm listening to Joel Osteen, then I'm listening to JT, and then I'm listening to Dr. Patrick Cohn. And I'm going to talk to you about Dr. Patrick Cohn. So I've learned how to breathe. I've learned how to breathe on offense. I've learned how to breathe in defense. I've learned how to breathe on the outside. I've learned how to breathe when you're in the pocket. The mm-hmm. idea when it comes to breathing is you have to have a constant flow. Mm-hmm. But I had to be mindful of that. Okay. And, t- and self-talk. You got to keep yeah. breathing. You got to keep breathing. Okay? And it, when I spar, those guys, I talk to myself when I spar. They just know that. Keep on breathing, dude. Stay relaxed. Stay relaxed. So I'm light from the fasting. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm breathing because I learned not look, I've had a bunch of great teachers, but no one taught me how to breathe. I mean, they taught me how to key eye and stay composed. Nobody taught me the art and the science of breathing. And you want to know what, here's how you live longer. Nose breathing. Mm-hmm. We are supposed to be breathing in and out of our nose. Our mm-hmm. mouth is not meant to be breathing. So, I mean, I'm practicing breathing like all day long. So I got my breathing thing down where I don't have to be mindful of it, but sometimes I got to uh, remind myself so I self-talk. So I'm also sparring better because I don't know how it happened, but I wanted, I said, okay, my mental game's off somehow. So I, I started Googling uh, mental strategies mm-hmm. for athletes and how to handle anxiety and pregame strategies. And I came across this dude, his name is Dr. Patrick Cohn, and his YouTube is um, Performance Sports. He's out of Orlando, Florida. Okay. And, I, and it, it was kind of like when I first opened my Bible. I didn't, when I first got my Bible, I didn't know what to do. So my friend at church said, just open the Proverbs. So I just opened the Proverbs, and I started reading Proverbs. Like, I wish I would have known that a long time ago. Wow! You know how, oh, my God, I've been making all these mistakes, and all I had to do was open this and not make mistakes. Well, this guy, Patrick Cohn, He made me realize all these mistakes that I was doing mentally. Hmm. Positive self-talk does not work for me. Hmm. It doesn't work. What I was doing is I had split focus, especially when I'm in the Pacific Northwest fighting, because everybody knows me. They're staring at me. They're staring at me. They're looking. I got to perform. I got to perform. You're going to see them later. And so I'm not thinking about what I'm supposed to be thinking about hundred percent. And that's exactly what's in front of me mm-hmm. when you're sparring. That's all you think about is what's in front of you, what your eyes see and stay in the moment. But I had been distracted by everything that was going on around me. Cause Hey, that's Rick Cropper. We all got to watch him. And I'm like, Oh man, I got to really do good. So I don't do that anymore. I just focus on what's in front of me. Mm-hmm. And my pregame strategy is this. I'm self-talking. Keep the flow of breathing going. Keep the flow of breathing going. Protect the center line. Protect the center line. Stay relaxed. Explode. Explode. So it's a, it's a bunch of stuff. And this has like only happened like maybe in the past year or so. And like my sparring partners are like, dude, dude. You have step up. What's going on? I said, I, I learned, and you taught me. You taught me because I'm fast. Mm-hmm. But I had a, a problem not getting, being able to get my back fist in at these guys, right? And then Marty said, you got to go back old school like you used to be, okay? Keep your hands like this, old school. And instead of always throwing the back fist, shoot the jab. And then this mm-hmm. way, too, your hands, not only in the offensive position, but they're defensive. Right. And, like, if somebody throws something at me, I don't have to do any of this. It's just 
yep. here and I, and I can go from there. Yeah. So there's another way how we, we help each other. So um, and then I've learned it recently. I've learned about are you familiar with brown fat? Yes. I just found out about brown fat this week and how to activate. So for the audience who, who doesn't know the difference between brown fat and, and white fat, adipose tissue, et cetera, give them give them. OK, so. So I, I want to go back to uh, it. Let me start talking about the, the fast again and, and okay. what the <laughs> fasting does. OK. After a certain amount of time, I don't know if it's nine or 12 hours when the cells are depleted of calories to eat, mm -hmm. the, the cells start eating fat mm -hmm. and the cells also start eating mist shape proteins. Mist shape proteins are what causes autoimmune deficiencies. Okay. Cancer diabetes and all that stuff so you fast your cells are hungry there's no calories they start eating all this garbage well the cells have a lysosome which is like a garbage disposal mm -hmm. it eats all this crud and it spits out brand new healthy cells how cool is that so it's eating your fat it's producing uh uh not excellent cells and then i got turned on to wim Hof. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm like, that dude, I learned about controlled stress, controlled stress through the cold. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now every day I do a cold shower. I try to do two minutes. I do my hot shower and then I do my, my cold shower. Okay. What that cold shower does is it activates the brown fat. Brown fat is like a heater or, or, or a radiator or something like that. And that also um, attacks all the bad stuff that's in your body. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm doing all and I'm and I'm I'm eating well. I don't I haven't eaten fast food since uh I fought in the NBL World Championships for the last time like 17 years ago or something. I cook food. I mean I I don't get enough sleep. That's the only thing because I get up early. I work all day. I teach and then I go cook whole foods. I go in there. I got food and I cook. I don't eat food out of boxes. I don't eat processed stuff. Maybe every now and then, but I mean, I, I cook, yeah. I get vegetables and meats and I, I need my omega threes. So I'm, I'm eating the avocados and all the fish and stuff. So I'm just doing all this stuff, you know? You're doing a lot of good stuff. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of good Actually, stuff. Actually, there's a, I'll, I'll give you a, a, I mean, it's it's generally considered bad form to talk about other people's shows, you know, on your show. But, you know, I'm, I'm going to mention a show that you might find interesting because the guy's not too far from you, Ben Greenfield. Oh, oh yeah, I'm a ben. yeah, yeah. yeah I I've, learned, I've learned a ton from Ben's show. And so a to the audience, if, if you're digging the stuff that Sifu Rick's talking about today, you might find Ben's show interesting. It's not, it's not a martial arts show by any stretch, but it is a show about, uh, he would, he would probably call it human optimization. But the dude's whack. He does some crazy he's stuff. He's nuts. He is absolutely <laughs> nuts. Okay, he's, so. he's so extreme, but you know, okay, I've check this really out. Check stuff. this out. Yeah. So I was watching him on the, on the, on the, uh, Joe Rogan podcast. Oh, I found out about, I start, after I started watching Ben Greenfield, I started getting um, grass fed yep. beef and stuff like that. But he, 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 he uses double extreme. He talked about how he'd go in the sauna mm -hmm. and then he'd go into uh, the cold water immersion. Mm -hmm. So I said, and at that time, uh, I've been in my house two years now, but after a, my divorce, I lived in an apartment down the street here for 13 years and there was a sauna. So I, I was, I, I, I did the sauna and then I watched yeah. Ben. He said, well, you should try this. So I went and I got about six bags of ice and I filled up the bathtub and then I, I put it in the bathtub and I went and, the, and my apartments had a beautiful gym. And nice. basically I was the only guy in there like all the time. So I went and I did my brutal workout and then I, I went in the sauna and then I went and I jumped in the ice tub. Oh, guess how long that lasted? Not long the first time. Uh, about two seconds. Yeah. 
<laughs> I don't I don't do that anymore. I do cold showers and I try to do two minutes. But I learned that from um Wim Hof. And I do his guided breathing sessions in the morning too. I'm up to a, a minute and a half of breath work. We've tried to get Wim on the show and he's so busy because oh there, there's a there's a lot of carryover for martial arts, yeah. a lot of stuff I think people would dig. I actually just found and and because I, I bet when you tell people about the cold showers, they they freak out. Oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. Yeah. I found a thermometer that threads in line with my shower head with a uh -huh. digital readout. So mm -hmm. every day I'm I'm bringing the temperature down at the end and I'm down to uh, 69 degrees as of this morning. Well, here's what's here's what's um, crazy. And here's what's sad okay. is we're we're meant our bodies were meant to be able to deal with extremes right. that's how we were built right. okay but what's going on now is everybody just wants to be comfortable like all the time 68 degrees is nice climate control is a beautiful thing and you know <laughs> what i can just do this and they'll deliver pre-made food to me so yeah. everybody's like they're like shortening their lifespans by making their lives too easy. Mm -hmm. And so I don't make my life too easy. Okay. Well, you know, I don't make my life too easy. Yeah, there, I, there's, a, there's a phrase you use, and I think it sums up what you've talked about so far. Controlled stress. You're yeah, intentionally stress. stressing at what seems to be an appropriate dose at the right time, knowing what the effects are going to be, balancing all that out, and getting a result and you know the the best example most people don't think of it this way but lifting weights that's controlled stress you're breaking your body down so Absolutely. it repairs itself and improves in a direction that you want yeah and everything so, else you're talking about is along those lines it makes sense but here's what's here's what's crazy um about the, the whole thing about not taking care of yourself is god gave us a body and our mm -hmm. job is to take care of it Right. Yeah. And the deal is, that unless you've been buried under a rock, now there's it's so easy to find the information on how to take care of yourself. I mean, back in the day before, I mean, it wasn't, but, but now there is, but it, it takes a motivation. Right. And, and that's the key, that's the key is, is you have to want to. And sometimes it can be hard. It can, you can get stuck in that trap of not feeling yeah. good. So not having the motivation to do the things that will make you feel good and be motivated something's got to break you out of that cycle well here's here's and here's what broke me out of the cycle it's the friday spar mm -hmm. it's the friday spar i got three of the best guys in the country there and i want to bring it i want to bring it and you know what i've been sparring with doug bertrand and our small group for a long time and i'm always the, the i'm always the mature guy <laughs> Not really. I'm always the oldest guy. I'm always the shortest guy. And my thought process for so many years was, you know what? I'm training with these guys because they're the best. And if I can do one thing right, it's a good day. What a terrible mindset. Setting the bar it's too a, low. It's a terrible mindset. I don't do that anymore. I go, you know what? These guys want me here because they know I'm good. I'm pushing them to make them better. I'm bringing my game. And then, but, hey, are, are you familiar with um, Psalm 144.1? No. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. <laughs> it pumps me up. Yeah, I can tell. You need that and on I, a shirt. And I straight up, I straight up on Friday mornings, usually when I pray, it's like, thank you, thank you, thank you. My kids, my kids, my kids, my girlfriend. But Friday morning, no, I go right to me. Lord, you train my hands for war and my fingers for battle. You train my fingers for battle so my arms can bend the world bronze. This is what I'm asking you today, that I spar better today than I ever have in my entire life. Make my hands and feet faster than lightning. Let them hit their mark. Let my defense be incredible. Let my legs move me all over the place. Let me breathe. Let me breathe. And then I'm ready. And I go in there and I bring it. And it's so much fun. Let me tell you what, halfway into that stuff, we're keying, we're laughing, we're, it's, it's, 
the endorphins are just like exploding. And it's just, I really, I don't know if there's got to be other people, but it's such an incredible thing every Friday. I just mm. can't, it's unbelievable. And I just, I don't know if it, there's a lot of martial artists. I don't think that even understand sparring or how beneficial it is. And I, you have to I have, agree. And you have to have the right sparring partners because sparring can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. And that's how a lot of schools, uh, they're, uh, is it called attrition? attrition? They, they lose students because of the sparring things because people get hit and this and that and this and that. And I, uh, I had a school in, in Portland uh, for 30 some years and I teach 400 classes a year for 30 years. But Friday, I'm like, no, Friday belongs to me. And Friday was my spar day. And it was just a black belt spar. And it was, mm -hmm. it was a good thing. I mean, I had Al DeCosco. He'd have his uh, world champions from Europe come in and all the top cool. guys here. And it was a good thing for a long time. But then um, people started coming into that thing that I shouldn't have let in there. Yeah. And, and it, it, it got to where um, like world champions would come in there and I have to like uh, – babysit them because they're trying to like knock each other out and stuff egos egos and then um i i'd have guys coming in there into my own school you uh the, the wolf in sheep's clothing mm -hmm. and these guys were trying to like hurt me and knock me out so i mean oh. so i shut it down and and man god people were like totally upset with me yeah you're an it's evil, you're evil, dude. You shut down the Friday. But, you know, it wasn't good for my my students because my students would come in and spar and these guys would beat them up. Yeah. Wait a minute. That's my family. And then so now my students aren't sparring and now I'm bringing my students to tournaments and these guys are awesome, but they're acting scared. And it's because these guys were pounded. Done deal. So then it was just my group. Yeah. Okay. And then that that was my my Friday evening spar, but I had my Friday morning spar with, with Doug Bertrand and, and those guys. So um, um, it's very important if you want to be a point fighter or if you want to get the benefits of sparring that you have to be with the correct people. People that uh, trust you, you trust them, you're trying to improve good attitudes, excellent technique, and super competitive. Mm. Because we, we really, we really push each other. I, hey, I'm a point fighter. You know, hey, I got a self-defense system. It's pretty excellent. We do uh, the Kaju Kempo, Kempo hard style forms. Mm -hmm. And then we do this Northern Silams. My, the style that I train and I teach now is the Kaju Kempo Chuanfa system. Okay. Mm. Um, I, I don't know if you know the history of Kaji Kambo. Do you? I, I, know? I know a bit. We've we've had you know we've had a few folks on. You know, um, I think it was Hackleman's episode. He went he went into the history a bit. Well, let let me tell you about my branch, and I, I know Please. I'm running. Please. I know I'm going on rabbit trails, and that that is my stuff. favorite episode kind of episode. Honestly, there's okay, no agenda so, here. It's you telling stories. Okay, so the Kaji Kambo system was developed. Uh, by five young Hawaiians in the late 40s, early 50s. And the leader was Adriano D. Imperato, mm -hmm. who um, has sat on my couch. I've cooked chicken and pork adobo for him. My kids oh, cool. call him Uncle C. Joe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he, he knew us. Yeah. And, um, hey, do you know who Al DeCosco is? Yeah, of course. Yeah, he's been, like, texting me every day for, like, past two weeks, like, multiple times a day. He's my eldest daughter's uh, uh, godfather. We got to get him on the show. Help us get him on the show. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll th what I'll do is I'll, 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 I'll talk to him as soon as we're done here. Sweet. He's, he's not my teacher, but he's my teacher. Mm -hmm. He's actually, he's actually the person who groomed me, groomed me to how to act and how to be a black belt. Mm -hmm. I've known him since I was 22 and I'm 62. So I've known him 40 years. Matter of fact, uh, I was showing my students last, last night. I have all these inside Kung Fu's and Karate Illustrated with, him on the front cover and he's autographed all of them. Cool. Yeah, I have a relationship with him. And then my I think my daughter talks and texts back to him uh more more than I do because that's just a godchild. 
and he and she wins grand championships doing the form that he created back in the uh, 60s. But anyway, let's get back to Kaji Kimball again. Sure. Okay, so it was it was uh, developed or was put together in, in Oahu in the late 40s, early 50s by five young men, and Adriana Imperato was the founder. It was predominantly Kempo Karate. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, 70s, late 60s, early 70s, Kung Fu started getting really popular. And C. Joe Imperato was, man, I really like this Kung Fu stuff. So he, he started uh, getting Kung Fu from the Chinese masters there in Oahu. And mostly what was being he brought into the Kaji Kembo system was Southern Kung Fu. Hmm. Okay, so you had in the beginning, it was Kaji Kempo, it, Kempo. And then when they started putting the Southern in, it turned to Kaju Kembo Tampai. Tampai means the central way. Mm. Well, Al de Costco's, he started getting together with some of the Chinese that were here on the mainland in, in the Bay Area. You know, Wan Jack Man? Mm-hmm. He's the one that fought Bruce Lee, right. uh, Ron Liu, um, who else? Uh, Cam Yen. And so Sifu Al started learning the Northern Sea Lum forms. Okay. Uh, Lin Po, Sui Wan, Si Lum, six, seven, eight, and nine. And so he, he, he had a meeting with Sijo in Oahu at the top of the Cosmo in the restaurant. And he, he started talking about, Hey, Sijo, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm learning all this Northern Chinese and I, I, th- I think it would be, you know, really good to in- incorporate it in. And, you know, CJ was kind of a roughneck and everybody's scared. And at first he's like, no. But anyway, he got, he got, he got the blessing from uh, CJ Adriano Imperato to incorporate the C Lum forms and all that type of movement into the Kaji Kembo system. Mm. So CJ was like, okay, it's not Kaji Kembo Kempo anymore. That's this. And it's not Kachikembo Tampai because that's Southern. We've got to come up with a new name for it. Also, that was the birth in the 60s of Kajikembo Chuan Fa. Al de Costcos and his very good friend, Al de la Cruz, introduced the Chinese form to Sijo hmm. and got the blessing to add it in. And Sijo said, we have a new Kajikembo now, Chuan Fa. Okay. So now there was three forms of Kaji Kembo. There was the old school, which was Kempo. Mm-hmm. Okay, hard style Kempo. And then the next style was Tampai Central Way, which had the hard style Kempo, but it also had the soft because it had Tai Chi and it had the Southern systems. And then it evolved to the third system, which is Chuan Fa. Okay. Chuan Fa had the C lungs. So we're considered, yeah, we got the hard style, but we got the soft style too. Mm. And then the fourth branch of Kaji Kembo is Wan Hap Kundo. Wan Hap Kundo means multiple fist way. And that's Al de Costco's, that's his system, his. So, mm-hmm. there's, there's, so there's four main branches of Kaji Kembo and mine is the Chuan Fa branch. Okay. So, and, uh, but, you know, the, the forms are, I love the forms. I really do. Um, that I used to have like uh, a bad memory, except for girls' um, phone numbers. <laughs> I'm just, hey, you told, I'm being real. I, I, I'm, I'm laughing not out of judgment, but out of understanding. Okay. We remember the things that are most important. <laughs> so, but, but here's the deal. Uh, I got to tell you about a brain fart incident. So, I mean, I've always been a point fire. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then I want you to ask me about my martial art trail here later. Yeah, but anyway, there was, there was, there was a time when uh, I said, you know, I, I need education because uh, knowledge is power and I'm kind of lost right now. And so let's go to college. So I went to college. I got some good stories, dude. I went to college. And I'm going to make this one. Brief. I've heard I'm, some of your good stories. I went stories. to college. And then um, uh, I'm in the typing class. Typing 101, right? And I'm like, yeah, it's just beginning typing. And I put all these girls going. 
And I'm just like, oh, 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 oh. but the guy sitting next to me is laughing at me. Right. And I'm like, dude, what are you laughing at? And I got to be friends with that guy. His name was Scotty Waterman. He goes, you know, uh, I see you got that Dan Anderson sweatshirt on. Cause, uh, Dan Anderson, my idol, you know, I've known Dan Anderson for like 50, almost my whole life. Mm -hmm. And he used to have a tournament called the uh, Portland Pro-Am. And I had my Portland Pro-Am sweatshirt on. And he goes, hey, uh, you do some karate or something? Yeah, I do some karate or something. He goes, you know, we got a karate club here at uh, Mount Hood Community College. And I'm like, yeah. And I, I looked in there, oh, three credits. I'm sure I can get at least a B in this. <laughs> So I, I joined I, I, I joined the karate club. It wasn't karate. It what was, was it? Taekwondo. Okay. And and the instructor was actually Grandmaster Taehong Che. I Grand that name. Oh my God. And I got stories about him too. Master Taehong Che, he's he's passed. Mm -hmm. But he he was like probably the most maybe one of the most respected uh, grandmasters in the World Taekwondo Federation anywhere in the United States. So I I, I entered his class, okay, mm -hmm. and uh, let me tell you about the first day I entered his class, and then and then I'll continue. And I'm yeah. I'm, I'm rabbit trailing, but I'm yeah, I'm, I'm that's make, all good. I want to make I want to make keep, you laugh and stuff. I want to make you laugh. You're doing stuff. a great job. Okay, so. Uh, second semester, hey, I'm not taking a typing class no more. That's just too stressful now. I'm going to do karate and business. And so I signed up for the karate class. And the first day of karate class, uh, I, I, I walk in late because it's a big campus and I'm, I'm lost. And so I'm in the locker room and I'm like, D dude, I'm like, how old was I? 21 or 22? I was in my early 20s. So you got, I'm, you know, what, 12, 13 years of training under your belt at that point? I started when I was four. Okay. So, and we'll, and we'll talk about that. Yeah. But, but I'm still, I'm still like cocky, cocky, dumb. <laughs> and I, I, so I, so I, I put on my, my Kung Fu uniform and uh, my black pants. And then I think it was for Christmas. I got the, the white instead of the black Kung Fu top with the front. It was the white one. Cause you know, I want to look like Bruce Lee. Right. So I, I walk into this Taekwondo class like 10 minutes late. The class is packed with all these guys with the white getting the pullover and the black mm -hmm. V-neck. And Master Che looks at me. And he goes, pajama man. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, pajama man. And right away, he goes, everybody make a circle. And I'm like, oh, I'm get oh, I've been here before. <laughs> he goes, pajama man. This me, nobody knows me. He doesn't even know me. Uh, he might have known me because you know I'd been going to tournaments forever and I'm just I'm well known on that thing. So pajama man in the circle. Oh, I'm not warmed up my hand. And then he goes, Boomer, in the circle. There was this guy from the uh, east side of Portland. His name was Boomer Fleming. And he's like, was a well-known, psycho, crazy street fighter. <laughs> How and tall was he? Let me guess. He's also like 6'7 or something ridiculous. No, no. He was an average dude. But the dude, okay. was, on, the dude was on steroids and all kinds. I mean, he was like... I mean, he looked like Hulk, except not green. He was white and blonde hair. And I'm like, oh, man. Okay, whatever. I already knew what these Taekwondo guys are going to do to me. They're going to try to kick my head off, right? That's what they try to do. So Master Chase set me up to get knocked out in front of all his buddies my first day, and I'm pajama man knocked out. Okay. Bow. Bow. Uh, what did they say? Come on, brother. I can't remember the Korean terms, but fights on. The first thing this dude does is he tries to cut me, cut my head off with a spinning hook kick right off the bat. Mm. This is what I did. I seen it coming. I slid underneath him like I was going into second base because I was a baseball player forever. Boom. And I busted him in the groin. 
with a sliding drop kick. And he's like, oh, go, 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 go. and I hopped up and I get back the line. And he's looking at me like this. <sighs> okay, go. So, you know, they're pretty much straight, right? Yeah. Back and forth. And they can't kick you unless they can set you up. And it's hard to set a person up who's moving. Mm-hmm. So I'm moving and um, I don't know if they're taught that, but that particular club, they always had their hands down. And mm-hmm. I'm just like, oh, I got something for that. <laughs> wow! I cracked this dude with the back fist. <laughs> so now he's worried about low and he's worried about high. Yeah. I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in the middle now. I'm getting some so real Bruce Lee one, vibes, not just not just the pajamas you're wearing but just the way you're talking about that back it sounds like uh, well, hey, enter I, the drag hey i never read a book in high school all i read was inside kung fu karate illustrated official karate and the Tao of jeet kune do yeah. <laughs> i still passed let's get this guy out of here no so anyway i faked the back fist boom i hit him with the vertical punch that i learned from fred king bang three points game's over but you know what that dude was cool about it. he ended up being a friend of mine. Hmm. Yeah. And and all those guys so it should be. All those guys started accepting me in. Okay. But Master Che didn't accept me in for a long, long time because I was doing Kaji Kembo with this. Uh, when I say BA, you know what BA means? Mm-hmm. I was training in in a basement with the most B.A. Kaji Campbell Street Fighters that got kicked out of all the high schools in this basement and doing my my Taekwondo. So my Kaji Campbell teacher's mad because I'm doing this and mm-hmm. he's mad because I'm doing that. But I'm just like, well, the deal is, is I'm 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 a Kung Fu guy now and I'm Kaji Kim guy and I'm using the Taekwondo as an inoculation. I want to know what they do because I'm going to fight those guys out there. Mm-hmm. But I made friends with those guys. I also did Taekwondo too because um. One time I was injured and uh, Master Che used to have a massive tournament every year at Portland State University downtown. And uh, it was always like on the one side of the gym is the black uniforms and the other side is um, the white uniforms and in the middle is the Coliseum. <laughs> but there were these Mexicans that were uh, young Mexicans that were um, going to Portland State mm-hmm. to get their degree. But they were Taekwondo guys. And these guys were the most beautiful kickers. Mm. And I think I might have that 30 year year old um, uh, video disc up in my my attic here. But these guys would put these five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten kick combinations together. And I'm like, oh my God, this is just beautiful. This is just incredible. I can't even, oh, so I wanted to learn how to do that stuff. And so, I learned how to do that stuff. So, and I, and I made friends with these, these Taekwondo guys and a small group of us. I mean, we're still talking to get, and some of those guys that were in that Taekwondo class are now my black belts. Nice. That, that I've known for yeah. 22, I'm saying 40 years or something. So I, I converted some of them. And then, um, you know, I, I, I've been throwing a tournament for a lot of years. Mm-hmm. And in the beginning, I, cause master Che connected to his school, he had a martial arts store and I'd go, Hey, um, master Che, um, can you bring the martial arts store to my tournament? And so you can sell gear and, and, and make some money and na 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 na. And so he did that for years, but I, I don't know if it's the first time or second time. Um, he goes, Rick, he didn't call me Rick. He called me Lick cause he couldn't say ours. Lick. Come sit down in my office. And I'm like, oh, he's going to scold me again. But he didn't scold me. He goes, hey, Lick, you're a big guy now. And it's responsibility to be good. I go, I'm not a big guy now. I'm five, six. He goes, you know what I mean? (laughs) So he actually ended up protecting me and, and being a counselor to me. Even though I was a Kaji Kimbo black belt, and even though, you know, he, he, he protected me a bunch. We saw. It sounds like he saw something. 
something well because i never I never i never i never quit martial arts you know how i mean come and go come and go come and go mm -hmm. i mean I, I never quit you know i never quit and you know um I've been around, I got a name and not everybody's my friend. You know, I have friends, foes, enemies, and a roaring lion trying to devour me. And, and there had been people that would come into his school and his store and talk bad about me. Mm. And you know what he would do? Throw him out. He'd throw him out. He'd throw him out. I mean, there would be, there's other schools. Cause I, you know what? I'm, I'm a member of the martial art community. I'm like the godfather of martial art community. Hey, I'm here for everybody. You know, hey, we're competitive in the ring, but you know what? We're all martial art, and I'm, I'm here to do whatever I can for you. And most, and I, you know, but it doesn't matter how, who you are, you're, you're going to have people that don't like you or whatever. And so there's other people all over the place who've had my back hmm. which makes me feel good sure you know so anyway uh, what's what, what, what you, rabbit trail you said on? you said you started training at four. Oh yeah there okay, are so very few people i know that. who started training that young I, i'm i'm also one of those folks who started at four i want okay, to hear about so your he, early your early journey well here's the deal i have a mom and dad and i have a grandma and a grandpa but um i spent most my grandma and grandpa raised me. I'll just be honest with you. My, my mom, um, I have I've found out that um, I think what she had was a post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. disorder because at like three or four years old, the war is going on. She's in the island. She's Filipino. I'm, I'm Hapa. Mm -hmm. I'm Hapa. My mom's Filipino. On her island, the, the, uh, the Japanese invade, the first thing they did was they killed her grandfather and she had to mm -hmm. hide in the jungle for years and years and years. And so... She had a really quick, nasty, mean temper. And so my mom and dad had um, a, a troubled marriage and dysfunctional. And it was it was too traumatic for me. So I spent a lot of time at my grandma and grandpa. So my, my grandma and my grandpa raised me. My grandmother taught me how to be a gentleman. My granddad was a professional boxer. Mm. <laughs> Um, he was German, but he, he fought under the name Mickey O'Day, the fighting Irishman. Okay, so at four years old, I had horse hair, leather, horse hide leather gloves on Everlast, and he taught me boxing. He had three sons. He never taught any of his sons how to box, fish, or lace up their boots. He taught me how to box, fish, and lace up my boots. Okay. He was a lefty. Okay. So mm -hmm. I first learned how to fight with my right side forward. And what he taught me was jab, cross, hook, uppercut, and slips. And how to make those combinations. And um, he also told me if you miss the hook, then you hit him with the elbow. <laughs> Which was not legal, but it is mm -hmm. now, right? Dirty boxing. So, like, and I'm I'm a loner kid. I have a sister, but, and I played baseball and I had friends, but I, I, I was kind of like a loner kid. So I, I spent time, a lot of time at my grandmother's. And underneath, okay, you'd walk down the stairs to the basement. Underneath the stairs was the stash of boxing gloves. Mm -hmm. And there was two main support beams in the basement. Okay, so I I lace up those boxing gloves, and that was my bag or my macawara. Jab, cross, jab, jab, boom, ba, 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 da, da, boom, boom, boom. So I go down there with the boxing gloves and bang, 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 and slip. He didn't teach me footwork. He taught me the 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 four basic punches and how to slip and how to make combinations. I learned my footwork because um, my grandpa had a, a leather recliner, mm -hmm. and it was like completely off limits to everybody in the world, except me. <laughs> and whenever a big fight was on, he said, Ricky, sit with me. And I sit in the recliner and we'd watch boxing. I'm still a boxing fan. Mm -hmm. I train like a boxer. I, I, I watch Lomachenko and, and Pacquiao and, 
and uh, <clears throat> and uh, Tyson all the time, all the time. I train like a boxer. I train like a a, a, a wrestler. Mm -hmm. I train like a martial artist, but so we we'd watch, and most of the time the big matches were Muhammad Ali, right? Yeah. So that's I I would watch his footwork. I would watch his footwork. So I would dance around the beam like Muhammad Ali, and I enter pop 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 pop, pop with with the punches that my grandfather taught me. So that was mm -hmm. my first experience of unarmed combat was boxing. Mm -hmm. That's four years old. Sometimes I mean I. Sometimes uh, I would be with my parents and we'd have things going on and there'd be martial artists and martial artists would ask my dad, Hey, when did, when did Rick, when did Rick start, you know, learning how to fight? And my dad said in the womb. Cause you know, cause my, my granddad, yeah. but then um, at six years old, uh, my, my uncle Ken uh, entered me in uh, a wrestling program mm -hmm at Madison High School, which is uh, six blocks from my grandma's house. Let me tell you what about that program. I don't think that they would let coaches do what they what they did. <laughs> I'm, to, uh, I'm I was sure. six years old. I'm sure they would not. They had us rope climbing up and it's like 20 feet up. You're six years rope. Do it, do it. And, and we're running stairs and we're running hallways. And it was just brutal training. On six-year-olds, um, six, I think it was six up to 12 years old. What the, it was, it was, um, it was, it was to get kids ready for when they went to high school because they had like the killer wrestling team. So they were like prepping kids to when they got to high school to be ready to be on their, yeah. so that's where I learned how to train really hard at six in wrestling. And I did that for like three or four years and never lost a match never lost a match but um but when i was uh, growing up in my grandmother's house there was always a lot of teenagers around and i'm just a little kid and they mm -hmm. used to do this deal where they grab one arm or two arms and they swing me around as fast as they could and my arms would dislocate mm -hmm. and they pop my arms back in mm -hmm. and do it again so here's mm -hmm. the deal when when you're young and you have that kind of injury and you don't get it fixed it's going to follow you your whole life Sure. So um, that's kind of what ended the the wrestling thing because I can't because my arm's gonna pop out. And I, I played baseball for a, a million years too. And so um, then, what was it? What was it? Oh, my uncle went to the Navy. Okay. Right. And one time when he came back from the Navy. He had a, a magazine and it was a judo and jujitsu magazine. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and the judo and jujitsu magazine came up missing. Yeah. I inherited that for myself. So I, I mean, I studied that thing and mm -hmm. I studied that thing and I studied that thing. And then I used to, um, uh, take my little allowance and there was a, a Rexall uh, uh, pharmacy and fountain like four blocks from my grandma's house and Tracy's Campo Karate was right next door to it. Okay, so I take my allowance and then before I go in the drugstore I'm just, my nose is pressed mm -hmm. against her watching them do Kempo. And this thing's really cool. They got black uniforms on and I'm watching all this stuff. And then I go in there and I get my cherry Coke, my iron on. And I don't know if, if you remember this magazine, but way back in the day, way back in the day, there was a magazine called Official Karate. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that one? And in Official Karate, I read it. But the most important thing to me is it was to show these hot tournament fighters mm -hmm. and it would show their techniques. Okay, so I I read that and I I practice those techniques. I practice those techniques. Okay, and then um, what was it? What was it? Oh, and then do you remember a guy named Aaron Banks? 
No. Okay, Aaron Banks is a New York guy, and once a year on the ABC Wild World of Sports, the Aaron Banks Martial Art Exhibition. And so once a year, I'm in front of that TV watching that. And then, okay, so I'm, I'm really starting to, I'm really, man, so it, the, it's like starting to grow in me, this martial mm -hmm. art thing. And how old are you at this point? I don't know. I don't know. I can't because okay. I'm 62. I got Alzheimer's right. coming on. I'm joking. I, know. I don't know. Young. Okay. And then, and then what? I, then what I'd start doing is I, I would take that allowance to. Well, first off, I would I would open up the phone book because that's old. So the phone book, mm -hmm. and I go to the martial arts section, and I'm looking at all these martial arts schools, and some of them had pictures and stuff. And then I had learned how to how to um, ride the 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 bus, mm -hmm. right? And I'm way too young to like be doing stuff on my own. Okay. But I'm doing stuff on my own anyway. <laughs> so I'd Not find surprised. a school. I don't know if I'd find a school and I, cause I usually on the weekend and I, I'd get on the bus and I'd go to these schools and I did the, I do the same thing I did at Tracy's Campo. Stare through I, the window. Yeah. Stare through the window. Yeah. Stare through the window. <laughs> stare through the window. And then I, I'd ride the bus home. And then there was a store uh, in it, uh, called Anson Oriental Imports. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd save up my money and, and I would go there and I'd buy the all the books. You know, all the uh, Chuck Norris books, the Cam Yen books, the Eric Lee books. I, I know Eric Lee too. Mm. Um, and so I don't know if you call it self-taught. But I was just like totally interested now in martial arts. So I'm, I'm boxing, I'm wrestling, I'm interested in martial arts. And when I did spend time with my dad and my mom, it would be on the weekends. And if I was with my my dad, he was the the, the captain of the Olympic weightlifting team for uh, Portland oh, State. Okay. So it would be in the Portland State weightlifting gym. And, you know, I've no lunch, nothing to drink. And so there's just a water fountain and I got no toys, but there's a, a universal gym and there's a bunch of dumbbells and stuff. So I'd go in there and while my dad and his partners are practicing for a competition because my dad was competitive, I, I'm like, I don't know how old I am, six, seven, eight, nine or something, 10, I don't know. I'm in there on the universal gym, leg pumping and oh, so I, I started working out. I didn't know mm -hmm. it was working out. And I think that helped me in my wrestling because I do a double leg takedown I, and I'm a small too. And I just be like throwing guys. So I started training young and I started really getting interested in martial arts. And so I started begging. <laughs> oh, dad, please. Come on, dad. Oh, you're a baseball player. I want to do this karate stuff. And so the campo, Tracy's Crampo School, they moved, but they just moved down the street next door to Marty's Guitar Shop. And I used to spend time in Marty's Guitar Shop, too, just looking at guitars. Because I, I love lead guitar. Mm -hmm. So I my dad signed me up for the, the beginning Tracy's program. Okay, so that was my introduction. And, and to, was it to Tracy's perform. because it was close? Yeah. It, okay. Yeah, it's in the neighborhood. Okay. Okay, so... And that's, it was all grab arts. It was all grab arts. And, um, and it was like, it, it was not large classes. It was just, it was one on me and an instructor. And I think the instructors were usually blue belts or something like that. Okay. So it was, it was all grab arts. But, but then that, that thing ran out. My dad didn't sign me up again, but there had been this dude hanging around my grandma's house that was friends uh, with my aunt and my uncles and he's like one of the dudes and um his name was danny anderson and my dad's like we're gonna go this karate tournament thing here in the memorial coliseum basement okay so we we went to the karate tournament the karate tournament at that time was called the western states karate championships and it was put on by um bruce terrell who's the founder and the leader of Oregon Karate Association, which now is called the Wu Ying Dao system. But back in the day, it was called Wu Ying Mun. 
and Dan Anderson was part of that. And so now I'm getting my first exposure of guys fighting each other. Mm. And I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, I don't know if you can see this, but the hair's already standing up on my arms and on the back of my neck, just talking about this. Yeah. So I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So I started the bag thing again. Dad, I want to do that. I want to do that. Well, you know, it costs money. Uh, well, this is what happened. I have a sister and I love her and all that stuff, but I'm like the black sheep and she's the golden child. So one time I'm, I'm, I'm begging my sister's there and my sister had been doing gymnastics. And I'm like, she gets to do gymnastics. And I want to do karate. And my sister goes, Hey, I want to do karate too. Oh, okay. I'm going to sign you guys up. <laughs> so my dad signed us up Oregon karate association on 106th and Sandy Boulevard. Mm -hmm. So let me go back a little bit. My mom's Filipino. Mm -hmm. Okay. My dad's Caucasian. And one thing my mom did was she was always bringing Filipinos from the island over here. They would stay here and she would get them a job, find them a husband and do all that stuff. Well, the, she used to get them a job at a place called United Medical Laboratories. And mm -hmm. it was in Park Rose over here. And I live, that's, um, way over here and I'm living over here and on the drive over there before you get to United Medical Labs there was this building on 106 and Sandy that had a big huge dragon painted on it a green dragon trimmed in gold and it just looked cool and it said kung fu on it and I'm just like whoo, whoo, whoo. and you know I mean we're because the, the, what we used to do is early in the morning, during the weekdays, my mom and dad get up, drive everybody to the uh, United Medical Laboratories, drive the, my sister and I to my grandma and grandpa's. They go to work. We're hanging out. Around. So every day I'm driving by this dragon in the, in the, the, the Kung Fu. And I'm like, I'm going to be in there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be in there. I'm going to be in there. I'm going to be in there. So finally, I, I talked my dad. Well, my sister wanted to do karate. <laughs> so he signed me, my sister and I up, and my Aunt Janet, my Aunt Janet, who just passed away, she was my guardian angel. She was my guardian angel. So my grandma, grandpa, and my aunt, even though I had a mom and dad, those are the three that I really credit to like raise. And my, when I didn't have shoes, my aunt would bring me shoes when I, I mean, my, my aunt was, she was my guardian angel. She, she gave me my name. She named me. My name is not Rick Cropper. My, my name is Enrique. Oh. Enrique. She gave me that name. That's my name. Enrique. My nickname's Rick, but she gave me that name. So it was, it was my sister, my aunt, and myself that joined that. But the person who had that school there, had moved. Okay. Mm -hmm. His name was Sid Lopez. He was Kaji Kimbo and he moved to Idaho, but another karate person moved in there and it was Oregon Karate Association moved in there. The instructor's name was Bruce. And at that time it was called Wu Ying Mun. Wu Ying Mun, I believe is the formless way. So okay. we never learned any forms in there. And actually, we never learned any kata in there. And we actually never learned any um, street in there. Hmm. It was all point fighting. And these guys back in the 70s, were the, they were the stuff. They were, the, they were really um, hot point fighters. And because I got turned so turned on by watching Dan Anderson fight, I'm like, yeah, right on. I, I want to do this. I want to do this. So um, that... So I was off and on with Oregon Karate Association from like 10 all the way to um, maybe junior year, okay, junior year of high school. And I'll be honest with you, like I said, you know, um, and, I, and I, would, I was point fight, so I, I mm -hmm. point fight. But then again, I had that bad shoulder, so I point fight and sometimes I get injured and then mm -hmm. I could, you know, so... I was still dealing with this injury. I mean, I was a good point fighter, but then I get in there, there goes the arm again. So um, that was uh, 
like maybe a, a dark cloud over my mm -hmm. point fighting thing at, at that that time but um and i'm i'm and i'm i'm a i'm a karate illustrated black belt magazine inside kung fu maniac okay uh in my my, my bedroom at my grandma's house and my parents have just stacks and stacks so that i'm you know, I'm not, I'm not lying. Really. The only thing I, I read cover to cover in high school was all those magazines and the Dow G can believe it. And um, matter of fact, uh, that whole time that I was with Oregon Karate Association, I was black sheep there. I was like, they're always mad at me because I wouldn't go in there like this. I'm like, doing your own thing. No, I was doing Bruce's thing full cover. Bang, bang, bang. bang. But and the I'm way the way Dan you wanted, Anderson. not the way they wanted. Yeah. Yeah, but it was working, and they're getting mad. Right. <laughs> but but you know, Bruce Terrell loves me now. Bruce Terrell now still calls me Ricky. <laughs> Ricky, Ricky. <laughs> so these guys that were mad at me and hated me, they still you know, they love me now because I never quit. I'm still doing it. So anyway, I'm reading these magazines. Oh, I when I was at Oregon Karate Association, in the locker room there was a magazine. There was a bunch of magazines, but there was one on top. I'm like, ah, if I inherit this thing, I'm probably going to get, you know, probably in trouble. So I read it. And on the cover of it was Benny the Jet Orchidas. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I read that thing over and over and over and over again. So, um, so Danny Anderson was like an idol for me. Mm -hmm. And Benny the Jet was an idol for me. Mm -hmm. Benny the Jet. Benny the Jet. Benny the Jet. Dan Anderson. Okay. So those are, and then I can't remember when it was or how old I was, but everybody, you know, uh, when my dad, I did spend time with my dad. It was in the gym or he'd take me to a movie. So first movie he took me to was James Bond Goldfinger. And I'm still a James Bond fan. I, I, I even like when I go out, sometimes I dress like James Bond and I act like James Bond and stuff like that too. But, um, he taught, he took me to, um, Enter the Dragon. Was it Enter mm. the Dragon first? Yeah, Enter the Dragon. And I'm like, oh, dude, you want to talk about the fire now? The fire is lit. And I'm like, I'm doing karate, but I think I love Kung Fu. Mm. I think I love Kung Fu. And so I don't know it was, because I think he took me to a matinee that day, and I think I got on the bus and went to J.C. Penney's with my allowance and I bought a, the white uh, t-shirt and some black sweatpants. Cause I want to look like Bruce Lee. Right. And then um, my grandma had a broom and this is funny. Cause boss Ritten tells his story too. My grandma had a broom and we had dogs over there and there was a chute that we used to put clothes in and it go down next yeah. to the, uh, but next to the chute, there were all the dog chains, right? You can, you can tell where I'm coming to get to, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I took, so I took the broom and I took a dog chain and I went in the basement and my, my great granddad was a plumber and my granddad after boxing, he was a weld. So there was a lot of tools, right? So I went down there and I put the broom in the vice <laughs> and I saw that sucker. And I, I, yeah. I cut it and then I, I got the bolt, the, 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 I don't know, I took the hack, sorry, the bolt, and, I, and I cut that, that, that dog chain. And then I got, uh, this was dangerous. And I got a yeah. hammer and hammer and some nails, right? And then I found some red spray paint, right? And when those dried, I went out in the front yard and. <laughs> And I started doing the nunchaku like I saw Bruce do. How many times you hit yourself in the back of the head? No, that's not the first bad thing that happened. <laughs> that's that's what I did when I made my own. Oh no, I got a story Bam. about that too. I got a story, <laughs> dude. I got a story about that too. But no, the thing came loose, and there was the front door, and in uh. front of the front door there was the storm door, and the storm door had a screen, and it was glass there. Uh. But oh, so I went from. The, oh, grandpa's gonna kill me. So that's a funny story. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm just, I'm just, Bruce, I'm, come on, man. 
Bruce Lee is a lot of the reason a lot of us are doing what we're doing, including me. Hey, I love Dan, Sifu Dan, Professor Grandmaster. I love Sifu, I love Sifu, but you know what? I didn't get to those guys unless it was right. Bruce Lee. Directly and or then, indirectly, still the most influential martial artist in the world. Yeah, and then, oh my goodness, then after that one, he, he took me to see um, Return of the Dragon, and that's with him and Chuck, mm -hmm. you know? And so super duper heavily loving Kung Fu now. Now, I'm reading these magazines, and I'm starting to see Al Costco off the cover, and I'm starting to yeah. read his articles. I'm like, okay, so these guys are tearing it up, in tournaments all over the place, mm -hmm. not in just sparring, but in, but they've got a street self defense system, mm -hmm. huh? A street self defense. So, and they're all Filipinos, and I'm Pinoy. I'm Hapa. Mm -hmm. I'm Filipino too. So, and I'm just wow. And I'm starting reading what Kajukembo is. It's karate. Judo and Jiu Jitsu, Kempo and Bo. Bo is for Chinese boxing, which is Kung Fu. But it's not just, the Bo is not just Chinese boxing. It's because all the all the founders of Kaju Kempo, they were all boxers. Mm -hmm. They're all boxers. Okay. So a lot of the punch counters that we teach is all coming from a straight right cross. Okay. Because in Hawaii, all they had was, um, uh, Boxing, judo, and kempo. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the punch counters are somebody's trying to throw a, a right cross at you. But I'm, I'm and then I'm, I'm, I'm really getting interested in this guy named Al de Cascos. He's Filipino. He's on the cover of all these things. He's tearing us up, and he's got a wife, Malia, and she's just incredible. Mm. And then so, so you got uh, that's it, Al de Cascos. Hold that a little closer to you. It's off, it's off camera. There you go. Al de Costcos. They're all signed. Al, all signed and autographed. At my 22nd or 23rd birthday party, I had a party. All of a sudden, he shows up with my teacher. And I mm. got this, because you know how guys are. All my trophies. I, I was renting my mom and dad's house, big house. And mm. then the, the fireplace was not really a fireplace. It was a... Uh, a trophy cabinet. <laughs> so, and, and up on the, on the, uh, what do you call that? The, the mantle? Of the fireplace. fireplace was this. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> and was that your first time meeting him in person? Yeah. She mm. Shifu. She she Will you sign this? And so look, he's on my 23rd birthday. He signed that. That's so cool. Yeah. He signed all of them. So, I mean, I've got a relationship with him, but that's the first time I, I, I met him. And I think it was like a week or two after that, we all ended up in a tournament in um, Yakima, Washington. And uh, it's thrown by a, 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 a karate master that's really, really super well known. And it was uh, a lot of white uniforms there and just a couple of black uniforms. And I had a black uniform on it. But hey. I was tearing it up. I was just tearing it up. And he's on the sidelines like this. And then I got to the, the championship match and I was tearing it up. But you know how things happen sometimes. Hmm. And I, I got totally robbed. But I, I didn't I didn't freak out or nothing. It's just like, you know, that's sometimes yeah. you win sometimes. And he was like, hey, come here, man. Man, you, you spar pretty good. You know, but you got greased. How do you feel about that? You know, you know, so that's the first time he saw me fight. And uh, what rabbit trail are we on now? <laughs> well, this is actually, a, we're going to have to have you back because I know we've barely scratched the surface. Oh, you barely. And because before, I before we talk about yeah. and I yeah, know him. We'll, we'll, Imp we'll, Rottle we'll, stayed with me and my, 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 my instructors. We'll, and you know what? I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll work with Andrew and we'll get you scheduled for, for a round two, heck, maybe even a round three. But I, I want to make sure that we get some time because yeah. you, you mentioned it, that you have, have a, a tournament and my understanding is it's a, a rather large tournament in your area yeah, and you've okay, been doing so, it for a while so let's talk okay, about that and then we'll we'll wind up okay so my my tournament is called uh the mighty river classic uh, uh 
November 4th this year was uh, the 23rd annual. Mm -hmm. But if it weren't for the uh, global pandemic, it would have been the 25th. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's it started um, in the Madison High School gym. Okay, which um, I always had this dream of someday I'm going to throw a martial art tournament in the high school that they threw me out of. No, <laughs> but the first tournament I did at Madison High School was the all Kaji Kembo tournament. It was me and, and uh, senior grandmaster Al the Costco's together was the first tournament I did oh, cool. at Madison High School. So he taught me. We got together. Oh, my God. Four to six hundred Kaji Campbell competitors from all over the world. There were people picking me up and swinging around, kissing me and hugging me. And so this is great. I didn't even know who they are, but this was pretty it was pretty cool. But then my first two tournaments, Mighty River Classic one and two was uh, in Madison High School 20 some years ago. Mm -hmm. And then um, I moved to Vancouver and then we had it at uh, Hudson Bay High School down the street and mm -hmm. it, it started to grow. Hudson Bay High School was really cool because there was a big basketball court there and the bleachers and then there was a mezzanine. Oh, yeah. And then um, we had some tournaments there, 400 competitors. It started mm -hmm. small. Hundred. I remember one year I had 125 pre-registers and everybody's like, dude, it's going to be massive. You're going to have 4,000 people there. And like had 125 pre-registered, like 126 people showed up. <laughs> But then one year, I only got like 25 pre-registrations. I don't know what's going on. And then it blew up like 425 competitors. It, yeah. it was it was like a Rolling Stones concert, people waiting in line. Yeah. And so um, we, we had to change the way we did that. So it was there for many years. And then the, the lady that helped me, she retired. And then somebody else came in and they weren't as helpful as she was. And so we, we moved the tournament across the river to the Shiloh Inn in the ballroom. Shiloh Inn is by the Portland airport. Mm -hmm. And we did that a few years, but we, we grew out of there. And I'm like, I don't know where to have a tournament anymore. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, every day I drive from Vancouver to Portland, North Portland, where I work in the Harbor and then back. And then I'm stuck in traffic on the way home. And I'm just like, where am I going to have a tournament? Because they want $12,000 for one day over here, and $8,000. And, and where do I have a tournament? And I'm stuck in traffic. And I, I go like this. On my way back and forth from work to home and home to work, I pass the Portland Expo Center where I went to my very first tournament at. Mm. And it's like, whoa wait a minute that's a good something's point. going on here so i called them up so we moved the tournament to the portland expo center they give me a hall they don't give me a hall i ran a hall at sixty thousand square feet wow seven rings sixty thousand square feet big space plan your room so we did that 2019 and then we got everything ready to go 2020. Bang! Pandemic. Yep. Okay, but there's, there's, uh, for me, there's silver lining in the pandemic. I did the Zoom thing for a while, then I said, hey, I'm done. I'm, this is what we're going to do, people. When things get better again, then we'll reopen the school. And then, and then, and then, So I just started, me and my daughter started solo training. Yep. Solo training, solo training. But I'm praying, bring it back, bring it back. And every time I, I go by the, the expo center, I'm lifting my hand and bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. Well, it, it came back. So this year was the first year that the Mighty River Classic came back since the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you what. Oh, my God. They have uh, some new management there. And that the person that was helping me set my tournament up, and and the, the Marriott Hotel and my bank and Minuteman credit. I have all these people. The, I take absolutely this much credit for, for the success of my tournament. It's all these people doing their expertise making my tournament. Yep. And basically, I just try to stay out of the way and try not to do too much dumb stuff. But when I do dumb stuff, these people help me not do the dumb stuff. <laughs> the tournament was massive. It was awesome. huge. It was smooth. We had competitors. We've had competitors from New Orleans, from 
Houston, from Austin, from all over the, I mean, boom. Yeah. Plus my daughter is a very popular person. And her group of martial arts friends, because now we have, it's really easy to talk to somebody. They're all world champion point fighters. And so we had all her friends were there. And the, so the tournament has grown, but it's not a karate tournament anymore. It's a martial art event. Mm. It's actually turned into like a martial art family reunion. Mm. The competition is like part of it, but just, everybody loving on each other everybody enjoying each other and there's stuff to do we have we have point fighting seminars the night before mm -hmm. you know ryan george 13 time world champion uh, malia's best friend uh aubrey bruner does a seminar we have a meet and greet at the marriott hotel on the river which is right across the street from um the, the the tournament venue mm -hmm. and when the tournament's done we have an after party where everybody dresses it's a a black tie party everybody dresses up nice and we're visiting and we're dancing and guys that just gave each other black eyes are like high five and stuff and so it's not just a karate tournament it's turned into like it's a mm -hmm. like a, a a reunion of That's martial nice. art people from all over the place enjoying each other and i'd be i'll be honest with you i took something that that, that my pastor used to do um before covid before he would start his sermon he goes you know what everybody let's take five minutes and just go enjoy fellowshipping with everybody yeah. and and everybody's just loving on each other so i do that now but i tell everybody first and i'll tell you why i started my tournament many years ago and why i started the kaizen league for that five minutes at my tournament, it's as loud as a rock concert. Mm -hmm. Everybody is smiling. Everybody's shaking hands. Everybody's high-fiving. Everybody's giggling. And I tell everybody, today, everybody, we're going to love each other. There's a lot of stuff going on out there. But in here, we're going to treat each other with courtesy and respect. And we're going to love each other. Hey, and it's a it's sporty, man. There's going to be conflict. You know what? We're parents and we're teachers and we're school owners. We're going to show everybody. We're going to teach everybody how to get through conflict and get to a resolution respectfully. So that's how I set my tournament up. Awesome. Hey, everybody, we're going to be good to each other, no matter what. And you know what? Nobody acted weird at all. A thousand people there, everybody treating each other right. Nobody that's acting true. weird. Nobody getting hurt, but competition at the highest level. And you see, guys, the black belts are out there. They're, they want it. They're bringing it. But if there's a good point, bro, good job. I mean, there was like respect between fighters. It was, it's such a good vibe. Look, my hair's standing up. Again. I see it. And, and you know, that <laughs> we, we kind of have the, the overarching theme of our conversation today that it's, it's about respect. That if you lead with respect, everything else falls into place well okay i i don't know if you you know or have heard about the kaizen league no please talk about it and, and you have a website i'm 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 the founder and the president mm -hmm. first president of the kaizen invitational martial sport martial art league um cj mayo is mm -hmm. now the who's, president who's been which, on the show ooh, he's a perfect person to be in that position but uh when i was in the something 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 league and I went to their something, something, something world championships. I noticed how much un, un martial art behavior was going on. Yeah. People in the crowds are fighting with each other. People in the crowds are harassing the judges. Competitors are acting like spoiled. And the whole thing was just like, and I and I brought students, and my my, my students are like, Chief. What's going on here? And I'm trying to explain, well, this is what sport martial. I said, you know what? It's crap. It's garbage. And it's not right. Yeah. It's totally, totally not right. And I, and you know what? I used to be a big sports fan. I'm watching sports, basketball, especially, but I'm watching young people who are making millions of dollars who get a foul called on them and then act like a spoiled brat. Mm -hmm. And that's on, media and then what happens is that transfers it gets inside of the people watching it and then it yeah. came to the martial art tournament so i'm like oh my god that guy and that kid that's active so i'm like 
I'm done with that. I love basketball, but I don't watch much sports anymore. I don't blame you. Yeah, because of the disrespect that they brought into our thing. So I'm like, you know what? When I have my chance, I'm going to start a martial art league because every part of the country has martial art, a martial art, sport martial art tournament league mm -hmm. or multiple leagues, but nothing in the Northwest. Mm. But we had the West Pack, which is part of the NBL, and we had a tournament here. Um, uh, uh, what do they call it? The Pacific Jewel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to compete there. But and actually, I was a chief referee at a lot of the largest tournaments in the NBL. But I'm like, you know, when I have my opportunity, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start a league here. And it's going to be it's it's going to be based. Its foundation is going to be respect. I love it. And honor and and the, the, the correct character. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not a perfect person, but it's got to be built on the tenets of good martial arts, which is not the fighting kick. It's been a morally well-balanced character, character, having good character and teaching that. Okay. So I had a chance to do that when the West pack went away, but another guy did it first, mm -hmm. but, but this dude ended up taking everybody's money, mm. ripping them off and split it happens unfortunately more more than than okay. more than it should and uh, i think that it, happened i think that happened before the pacific jewel and the west pack went away but i was at, at the last pacific jewel tournament and then i'm saying to myself okay this is the, the golden opportunity to do what i've been dreaming about so what i did was I, I contacted um, Jerry Pittington. Do you know who Jerry Pittington is? Grandmaster mm -hmm. Jerry. He's, he's been on the show. I contacted him. I contacted CJ. I contacted um, David Carmen, tournament promoter, and I, I contacted Dennis Elliott. Okay, so these are their 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 promoters and and they're 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 well-known people in the martial art community. And I, I felt that I could trust these guys. Mm -hmm. And I said, Hey, this is what we want to do. So that was the beginning of our executive council. Mm -hmm. And what we did for like a year or a year and a half is uh, we'd meet at, at my apartment and they love coming there. Cause my daughter's a, like a novice chef and she'd have all kinds of food. So it's, Oh, we're going to get something to eat. So what we did for a year and a half is we came up with, all the, the rules mm -hmm. and the bylaws and the, all the stuff. And uh, a big help was the Dojo League back east. Uh, Hanchi Pennington um, has a relationship with them, and he got their, their rules. And mm -hmm. then so for a year or a year and a half, we went. Yep. And then we, we started the league. I think the league started in a. I think we're in year six or seven or something That's awesome. like that. That's awesome. If people want to learn more about that league and your tournament, is there, there are websites and things for those things, right? What are, how do people go deeper on that? Um, I think it's, uh, I know we've got Kaizen, at least one. Kaizen, Kaizen, Kaizen league dot us. Okay. I think it is. And it'll have, you know, the tournaments listed right. and, and it'll, and but I'll, I'll call CJ when we're done here too. I'll call C Puel too, and I'll call CJ too, and then um, all the tournaments listed. But it, it says what 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 this what this league was built on. Great, cool, and, and yeah, we'll have, we'll have, have that in the I'll show. Be notes. With you, I both. have absolutely zero. Uh oh, running out of battery. Well, you, right you got enough for us to finish up. I yeah. I can see you. I can. Uh, I all have right. absolutely zero tolerance. Zero patience for disrespect. Zero. Zero. And I tell people at my <laughs> tournament for a long time, hey, but, but if you do act, in you know, and then I'm going to personally walk you out to the parking lot. I don't care who you are because it doesn't belong here. And they um, know I'll do it, but I haven't had to do that. This year, oh, my God, there was so much love. It was incredible. That's, that's great. And that's what I'm finding at, at other events. Is anything that had to take a hiatus, people came back and they were so grateful. Because they realized yeah. what what they had missed. Now, if people well, want to get get a hold of you, we we got it. We got to wind up here. I'm sorry. Yeah. If people want to get a hold of you, email, social media, anything like that 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 you can share with folks. Yeah. Uh, 
they can email me at cfu rick cropper at gmail.com it's about as easy as you get All yeah right. cfu rick cropper at, at gmail.com awesome and so now the, the last thing i'm going to ask of you it's it's you know we've only scratched the surface i know we've only scratched the surface i do <laughs> i do I always ask the guests to to kind of provide the final words for the episode. So what what is it you want to leave the audience with today? How do you want to sum up our conversation? Hey, I want to, especially I want to talk to the uh, the senior students. No, I want to talk to all the students, all the teachers, all the school owners, all the everybody is we have a responsibility as being martial artists to show the non-martial art community, okay, the benefits of the martial arts and first off i don't want to start with the physical benefits because there are plenty of physical. it's about the being a good human being hmm. not perfect because there was only one perfect okay but let us show them that we're good people we have good moral character and the, actually the the physical stuff is for health this also it's, it's our insurance policy hmm. because you know what? The world's full of good, but you know what? The world's also full of bad and mm -hmm. nobody's allowed to hurt us or our families. And we're allowed to defend ourselves. And if we're allowed to defend ourselves, your martial art better be on point. It better be on point. Cause you know what? If you get into altercation, it may be the last thing or not. But be good, make sure your art is strong and pass it down and love people. Be tolerant because that's that's another thing. You know what? D don't fight out of anger because that's just not right. You know, don't fight out of anger. But see, I like to fight. That's why I go spar. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely going to have you back. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, because, man, I still got, I got tons of stuff, man. I know. I told you this was a great one. I told you it was high energy. If you were anything like me, as you listen to this, you were jazzed. You were juiced up. You were, okay, I, I, I got to go train. I got to go do something, right? As soon as I was done, my heart rate was up. I, I, I just, I felt like I could go run a marathon just by talking to this man. Being in his presence, even more intense. Sifu Rick, thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing part of your birthday with us. I'm absolutely honored. And I look forward to the next time we talk and am super pumped to get to meet, well, see you again, train with you again, and look forward to when that happens. Audience, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Photos, videos, links, show notes, transcripts, all the good stuff. Sign up for the newsletter. Maybe leave us a tip. Look at the other episodes that we've done and share this stuff with other people. We grow when you share. And selfishly, for you, when we grow, we attract new awesome guests. So keep that in mind. If you have a martial arts school, consider our consulting services. There is no obligation. If you want to talk to me, I give everybody a free hour. We're not at a point yet where I can't find ways to schedule that. So until that happens, I will give anybody who is interested a free hour. It's the best way to find how our philosophy translates into the consulting side in the way that we can help you and your school grow. Do you want more students? We can do that. Do you want more profit? We can do that. More revenue per student? We can do that. Do you want to improve the culture of your school? We can do that. Do you want to train up assist assistant instructors so you're not working 25 hours a day? We can do that too. Reach out to me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Or what if you want to bring me in for a seminar? I love teaching. I love sharing the things that I'm passionate about beyond this show. There's physical stuff, physical training that I'm passionate about. And it applies equally regardless of your style. So reach out. We can talk about that too. Now, our social media for Whistlekick is at Whistlekick. YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. Instagram, um, I, I miss some others, but you just search at Whistlekick, you'll, you'll find us. And that's it, that's the end for now. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.